So, uh, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Yasmin bin Humam. I'm a financial sector specialist at CGAP, and I'm co facilitator of the Women's Financial Inclusion Community of Practice. This webinar is on gender insights from FinScope, the story of her. And just a few housekeeping matters. Uh, you'll probably have noticed that all participants are muted upon entry, uh, so as not to interfere with the flow of the webinar. Um, but we do want to hear from you. So please submit your questions and comments uh, to us via the chat function, which you should see on the right-hand side. And be sure to select all panelists. We are monitoring that closely. Also on the right-hand side, you should see a polling function. This is for at the end of the webinar. It's a very fast three-minute poll, which we hope you will complete. Uh, so this webinar on FinScope follows presentations by Intermedia on Financial Inclusion Insights and by the World Bank on the Global Findex as part of our community series on sex disaggregated demand-side data on financial inclusion. And uh, our speaker today has many names and many talents. He goes by both Abel and Abel, but I'll refer to him as Abel today. He's a research specialist with Finmark Trust and project lead for various FinScope consumer survey studies. He also performs customized data analysis according to users' needs and has been involved with numerous gender analyses, notably including FinScope's Rwanda's findings. And his expertise includes geographic information systems and data visualizations. And he has recently been promoting the use of data for product design in driving the financial inclusion agenda. So I think we found the right person to translate data into messages and action for you, our audience. And I hope that you will send your questions to Abel via the chat box, um, which he and I will monitor during the presentation. I'll relay the messages to him after the uh, presentation, um, though as I mentioned, he'll also be able to see them. And at the end of this webinar, Dina Borgiorgi, who is my co-facilitator in the community of practice um, and also leads the data and measurement working group, will give you some information on things we have planned. Um, Abel, if you can actually go to the... Um, uh, Quick start. Working. Oh, I perhaps I forgot to upload the slide. Um, we did have some uh, insights from our um, our community of practice members on the various uh, use cases that they use the data for and the various learning questions that they have. Uh, for um, gender disaggregated data in women's financial inclusion. And uh, I did have a slide on that, which I forgot to upload, but I'll just summarize quickly for Abel, and he'll reference back to those use cases as he goes through his presentation today. And Abel, what we found was that we have a lot of um, policymakers who have used FinScope data who want to know how we can track progress in financial inclusion and how we can measure meaningful financial inclusion for women. Um, so hopefully you can speak to that. We had a lot of international NGOs and multilateral development organizations who use this data for their um, program design. Um, so trying to figure out things like where are are the most excluded women? Um, what are the use cases that these women have for financial services? What are the barriers that they face in accessing financial services that these uh, programs can help them to overcome? We've also received feedback from people in academia that they like to use these kinds of data sets to test their hypotheses on the impact of financial inclusion on measures such as women's uh, economic and social empowerment. Um, so perhaps you can refer back to those uh, use cases as well. And um, without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Abel. Look forward to your presentation. All right, thank you, Dina. Um, welcome, everyone. 
Um, just a second, I just need to upload, uh, share my screen. Okay, fine. Um, can you see the slide? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, today, I tried to centralize the data and the analysis around a woman. Um, so, the, the, the presentation is titled The Story of Hair. But basically, um, the whole discussion and the presentation will be based on how, how does the data inform um, women advocates and what kind of issues can we start unpicking. Um, without further ado, um, this is the short uh, content for the presentation. I uh, will look at the data coverage and then we we'll look at some view data variables and then also start unpicking uh, what kind of gender analysis you can do. Um, as far as possible, Yasmin, uh, based on the use cases you found, I will try and address some of them. But I think also I've added some slides at the end of the presentation. I might not get through to them, but the users are able to then go through some of the analysis and use cases uh, that we have done using the, the FinScope data. And then much more important, I'll just have one slide on the planned activities we have as, as FINMA Trust. Okay. Um, the first objective for this session is to highlight where is the data. So currently, all FinScope data, or most of FinScope data, they are in the data portal. So we are trying to visualize uh, the data set and what you can what you can do with the data, starting off with the UNCDF data portal. Now, I'll talk a bit more about it on the next slide. Um, and then we also have the eye to eye data portal. So both those data portals, the download for the data is free. So you go to the site, and then you download the data after playing it out, around with it. And then also, we also have another email, by, by email request, you can email info at FINMA um, with a specific uh, country you want the data for, and then we'll be happy to share. So some of our pa partner countries, um, including the likes of FSD, we do have their contact addresses, we'll pass you through uh, to the relevant data owner. Um, now that we got the admin out of the way, coming back to the issues around women, the big question is what do we really want to know about a woman? So in the financial inclusion space, these are some of the uh, pertinent questions. Um, Yasmin, we, with your permission, I would like to go through all of these, uh, the questions on the left, because it starts mapping what kind of questions FinScope data can answer for you. So the first question would be, uh, does she walk for hours to fetch water? Um, is the water even clean? Um, how does she feed her family? Does she have a small business to make ends meet? Um, what happens when the drought uh, floods destroy her crops? Um, as a teacher, where does she get her financial advice from? Um, when she's sick uh, and she needs medical attention, where does she get it? If at all she does get it. Um, to receive money from other kind-hearted family members, where does how does she get it and where does she go? Um, to provide for her family needs, how does she, how does she use, or does she use uh, carbon-based fuel? So this is now linked to the issues of clean energy. But anyway, I'll talk about this later on. Um, is she educated enough? Uh, is she empowered to make financial decisions? And how does she earn her money? So basically, these are the starting points to really start unpicking what financial in, or what the needs are that financial inclusion is trying to meet. So from this whole list, you can start painting a picture that FinScope data is comprehensive enough to start giving you some of the lead answers to some of these questions. Obviously, it, it, it also has its own limitations to the detail, but the good thing also is that it, it, it starts giving you a pointer and then uh, if you need further research, you can then do in-depth uh, surveys or in-depth interviews on a specific area of, of interest. Um, part of then, when it comes to women, I think one thing that I really liked with the UNCD portal is that it doesn't only pitch financial inclusion um, in a vacuum. Now, what it starts to do is start to pick financial inclusion with relation to SDGs. Now, looking on the right of that slide, 
it, you can start looking at the issues, and most of these issues, they really impact women more than men. Um, issues of gender equality, obviously, quality education, all those things. So access to finance, idea is a means to start solving the SDG um, uh, indicators. So this is, uh, at the conception of FinScope, I think it was way ahead of its time because it started addressing some of this even uh, before the other service that uh, started collecting such data sets. Um, okay. Basically, what the FinScope data gives you is these three, uh, three tiers. Um, these are the characteristics we want to really know about her. What is her community environment? And what kind of facilities is she, is she socially connected? Um, what is her household structure, sources of income? How many income earners are there within the household? Uh, what are the what are the infrastructure or asset ownership within the household? But at the end of the day, the, the unit of analysis is still an individual. Um, talking about that, so with FinScope data, the advantage also it gives is that it has household weight. So in other words, things like household assets, um, some of the, the results and analysis is best analyzed at, at, at household level. So then you start using that kind of uh, household weight. And then, but prominently, the, in the, the unit of analysis for FinScope data is still an individual. Uh, back, so basically, the question is, what kind of financial services uh, does she have? Uh, financial engagement, what are the barriers to uptake or use of financial services, and what are her perceptions, the demographic characteristics. We will unpack that later on. Okay, now as an example on the community space. Um, obviously the first question is, what are the services that are available within her precinct? Uh, within a 10 kilometer radius, within a 5 kilometer radius. Uh, nowadays, I've seen more analysis, doing analysis at 1 kilometer. So, more and more services are, are coming closer to the people. But linking this to, to, to FinScope, one of the results and one of the prominent indicators we've been tracking over the past couple of years is access to facilities within an hour. Um, it's debatable whether an hour is a good measure or 30 minutes, given there are more uh, services now. Uh, but you can start g getting that kind of nuances with the FinScope data. So in Burkina Faso, for example, 88% um, of the females are able to access a bank within an hour. Um, but looking at a similar example on the medical, so uh, that of those that are more than an hour, it's 9% uh, of the medical center. So 9% of the females are able to access a medical center within an hour. Now, ov obviously, one thing I wanted to bring in light now is that, yes, previously the conversation has always been at financial access points, but more and more of the data collected now is about schools, it's about uh, medical centers, because we are more and more uh, service providers are starting to tie and make the links between a school and as a, as a super agent or an access point. So this kind of data starts giving you what kind of coverage is on the ground. Is it a retailer, is it a supermarket, is it a school, a medical facility? So it starts giving you ideas how best to roll out a financial product. Um, still within the community space, uh, one of the uh, the questions we ask is access to information. Um, I remember your comment, Yasmin, on are the questions the same in all FinScope data? So the wording might change slightly, but ultimately we ask people what kind of uh, media channels they have had access to in the past seven days. So we can we can start uh, disaggregating the data by women who have watch TV, for example, we have read a magazine. Because similarly, that also helps us inform what kind of uh, communication channel you should use when you roll out a product or when you roll out a program. Um, and then linked to that, the, the issue of social connectivity is a big issue now, um, especially people who belong to a social group. 
So in Kenya, for example, 50% uh, of the female belong to a social group. So in the social group, it, it's not necessary or it's not default that they are offering financial services. But it's more likely than not that this grouping, because of the power of, of numbers, they can start lending money to each other or creating savings. In South Africa, for example, the stock sales, uh, which is the savings group, that women uh, in the numbers of 30 to 100, they save their money monthly, and then come December, they all share this, uh, the, 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 the pool. That then gives them the buying power for the December holidays and for the in preparation for the next year. So this is a social context is always important when you, when you analyze the data. And that's also part of the, I guess, the advantage of InScope data is that it always gives you that that context about a country. Um, now, when we filter down to household level, um, like I said earlier, they, they, there is a lot of work now in the financial inclusion space that is being done on clean energy, and clean energy is meant to addressing one of the SDGs where. Uh, to combat uh, mortality rates because of uh, carbon-based uh, diseases like uh, carbon monoxide infections and all those things. So more of the services that are being prepared, uh, that are being offered now, like uh, prepaid uh, solar panels, prepaid uh, lighting systems, uh, home solar systems, are being created because, one, we do know that it's a, it's a heavy capital expenditure uh, for households, especially with poor households who don't earn much, for them to really uh, cough up 10,000 US dollars, for example, to buy those things. It's not really possible. So then the pay as you go example then creates means to an end of, of clean energy or a solution within the clean energy space. So obviously, some of the data you, we do have, um, but it, it depending on country context. Okay. Okay. Um, now, on the individual space, obviously, the the one of the things that we always want to unpack is access to financial services. Now, there's two things I wanted to communicate with this slide. There is always a focus on formal financial services. So, uh, in Switzerland, for example. 34% uh, of the females are saving through formal channels. 7% um, of the females are borrowing from formal channels. But the point is, if you really unpack the data, more of their, their financial transactions is happening in the informal space. So the same women in Swaziland, 34% of them are, are accessing credit from informal services. So what this then gives you uh, also starts helping you as a policy maker to really see uh, how do you best increase financial inclusion. Now, the starting point, obviously, is that they are accessing credit. Though it might not be at formal institutions, but they are accessing credit. It's a different story to someone who is not accessing credit, or when you talk about insurance, for example. Um, it's a different issue when somebody is insured with an informal service provider than somebody who is not insured at all. Because the first thing you, need, you then need to bridge is uh, create that financial awareness. Why do people need to be insured and all those things? So this then gives you a starting point of where are the people at and what kind of, of, of channels or interventions do you need to do? Now, one of the, the questions I had in there is, um, it has been a prominent question. And, I, don't, I haven't seen a, a, a concrete solution to it. How do you really start tackling informal markets? Now, one of the things I, when I presented at the Global Youth Forum is that more of the conversation was around accepting the status quo, but supporting the environment. In other words, instead of formalizing the informal market, see how best you can support it without uh, creating a barrier by formalizing the, the, the environment or the market. Um, this is just some of the things in scope data can start giving you. Now, uh, the second objective for this webinar is to understand where, at, where is the data? Uh, what, what information do we know about a woman? Now, 
We have covered most of Africa, and most of our activities now are in the west of Africa. Um, and we have started a survey in South America. Haiti is going to be our uh, our our first um, South America field group. Um, but my understanding is there will be more to come soon. So these are some of the countries that you can get the data for. Some of these data sets, uh, some of these countries, they have more than one uh, data set. So in other words, you can start creating trended data. In South Africa, for example, you have like uh, over 12 years of trended data on financial inclusion. That answers your question on uh, on how do you check progress, uh, Yasmin, uh, to, to one of the questions that was asked. So the mere fact that we, we regularly repeat the field scope survey, it also with the similar questions, uh, we always update due to context, but it starts giving you the ability to track the progress and to monitor the interventions or programs that have been implemented in a particular uh, space. So, um, though oddly, they are re most of the countries they repeat the service around after three or two years. Um, Okay, now, FinScope survey is nationally representative. So in other words, a country like Mozambique, it starts painting a picture of, uh, of the whole entire country with weighted data at other level. Now, for policymakers as well, it then helps you create financial inclusion targets. Now, there are few examples that I've seen where the financial inclusion targets included those for women. So my question in there, is there space for such conversation to be had even? And then what does it entail? What does it mean? And then there, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of use uh, in the program use cases. Um, and then I wanted to highlight the private sector use cases. So this comes back to your point on multinational using the data for product design. So in South Africa, for example, the FinScope survey is funded by the private sector. So in other words, the private sector, especially the banks, they have really understood the power of this data on how does it then uh, inform their product, including over and above the, the positioning of their access points, like ATMs and branches, because of the data. Um, we recently presented one of the banks, and now they are really worried because more of the telcos, MNOs, and the insurance providers that are getting a banking licenses. What does it mean for them now? So obviously, understanding the data and the trends, you are, still, you are starting to really understand your segment and your strengths as an entity. Um, the last point on the data needs, besides the fact that it's national representative, I think the value, more of the value on the analytics side is that you have sufficient sample sizes to really do further seg uh, segmentations on analysis. So unlike using a base of a, a thousand for argument sake, you then uh, find it very hard to then cross tabulate a woman in a rural area who is a farmer. Now, obviously because of the sample sizes, there's, no, there's limited analysis you can do. But based on the sample size that FinScope does, you are able to do because we are looking at minimum of around 5,000. Okay, and then there's always uh, an emphasis on the regional, uh, regional representativeness. Now, for other developmental agencies and NGOs who want to do uh, women-centric activities or interventions or programs, it then becomes very important for them to decide which areas to go to first. So then FinScope then gives you that ability to really start kind of ranking the regions in terms of priority areas or where to go first. Um, and it, help, it helps you for your program design. Um, the rest of the other con uh, points I've mentioned and we'll, we'll unpack that later on also. Um, and then similarly, one of the, 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 the starting points of financial inclusion is always based on income, right? The question is, how does she earn her money? Now, you, the richness of the data gives you an ability to really unpack 
what the sources are of the of their income, how they get the money, how frequently they get the money, and really start understanding the, the household dynamics, how many income earners are they in a household. Um, and then this is just one of the the, the banning issues, I guess, in the, in the financial inclusion cycle, bank account usage. So obviously the first thing would that we always need to understand is what is the bank account usage uh, disaggregated by gender. So this then starts giving you a paint, uh, starts painting a picture. So Zimbabwe, for example, 91% uh, of the female bank account holders are dominant. This is compared to the 43% in Malawi. So obviously, then the first question would be, if you were to choose a country to start uh, creating a uh, work on the bank account dominancy, obviously the choice would be Zimbabwe because there's more you can do, um, followed by Malawi compared to Botswana. Um, all this time I was talking about fee scope consumer. One thing I also wanted to bring uh, to, to the participants' attention is that we also have small business service. Now, what they, this, this kind of surveys do or differ with, with the consumer is that the specific focus is now on business owners. Now, uh, also similarly, there, there is more work. Uh, for example, the uh, women, well, women banking, they focus on women enterprise ownership. So starting off, uh, this is an example from Switzerland. 74% of the women, uh, women they tend to be independent entrepreneurs. So which means their business is one man show, or one lady show. Um, and then the question is, how, how do you start helping them to move up the ladder, to become a micro business, to help those that are micro to become small, and then to upgrade those that are small uh, to medium? So in answering this question, one of the things we have then done with the data is created an indicator called business development mod, um, uh, measure. It then uses the country relevant data, start really unpicking what are the factors of influencers for a business to be m more developed. So in other words, in Switzerland, for example, a, a, a more developed businesses would have a bank account. So. Uh, would also have uh, toilet facilities, would have access to uh, to market, and would have on average, they would employ on average three employees. Using this data also, it starts helping policy makers. If somebody wants to become an entrepreneur, what should they do first? Now, given the data and some of the insights from the data, it starts telling you, one, go and open an account, two, have access to electricity, three, have own some kind of de uh, communication device and have be mobile with some kind of transport. So those are the things that when you really analyze the data, start giving you those kind of insights. And obviously uh, linked to the business side, it also starts helping uh, businesses, banks and uh, credit providers to really kind of filter and credit score, for lack of a better word, credit score um, a business for them to support. So this is now one of the things that we have uh, advocate, uh, used the data and helped businesses add into their credit scoring model. Um, the last point I wanted to make on this slide is that on the most developed side, in Switzerland, there's a case that 39% of the most developed businesses tend to be owned by women. So linked to that, the question then becomes, uh, as an academic in this case, um, how do you help women that are in the emerging business uh, develop or what kind of interventions are needed? Uh, I guess then this will form a good uh, research topic on the hypothesis to test. Abel, I'll just very quickly jump in and say we're at the half an hour mark, but we haven't received too many audience questions yet. Um, so I'd like for you to continue going uh, forward with the presentation for an additional few minutes. Um, okay. And again, to the participants, we are monitoring um, the chat box. So send your questions as they arise. But please continue, Abel. All right. Thank you. 
Um, and obviously, one of the most uh, prominent issues or, uh, in the women's space is the gender gap, uh, gender equality and all those things. So starting off on the financial inclusion side, um, the question then becomes, what are the differences with, with reference to bank account ownership? So this slide now starts painting that uh, picture on gender gap. What are the differences? Where are the differences? What are the influences? So in South Africa, for example, more women are banked, not because of their willingness to go and get a bank account, but it's more driven by the uh, grant, uh, grant uh, welfare, welfare grant or child support grant. So because they are mother legally, the, 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 the policy is skewed towards mother, so mothers would then be the, the recipients of the child grant. So by default, they would then be banked because the channel of distribution through a bank account, which is in their name. So these are some of the nuances. Yes, you, you can understand this, but you, the country context then matters. And Abel, we do have a question in from Petronella regarding from Petronella Chigara regarding this slide on the dates for all of these uh, countries, um, whether it's all to, to 2016 data here. Um, no, it's not all 2016. Uh, that's a good point. So I think we will then update the slide with the year of the year of the survey. For example, GRC would be 2014. So most of this, yeah, most of these countries would be 2014, 2015. Yeah, 2014 and 2015. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question, Petronella. Um, I think also on the use cases side. So one of the one of the requ requests from a donor was that they wanted to then test where are the women that are informally served and what can be done um, to serve them formally. So th then the data enables you to start unpacking or disaggregating uh, the data according to some kind of characteristics. So in Rwanda, for example, the total women, uh, this was 3,400,000 odd, and those that were financially included, we looked at, we are looking at around 2.9 million, and then those that are excluded, meaning they do not have any, uh, they do not have any financial services, uh, 461,000. Within that, we are then able to disaggregate from that 400, how many are ultra poor, meaning they really cannot afford, or with the country definition of Ubudehe. Ubudehe is a, a country classification of, of poverty. And then from those that are included, you, the main issue was to disaggregate those that are informally served. Now, with the emergence of mobile-based solutions, obviously the first question would be, how many of the women have access to a cell phone? and how many of them own a cell phone. Um, and similarly, what kind of financial services are they using? In this case, they are using uh, social uh, savings groups, unregistered savings groups. And then linked to this, we started to unpack what other characteristics could be used to disaggregate the data, to start really unpacking what kind of solutions or interventions can be done uh, to, for those women that are informally served to become formal. Uh, to become formally served. Okay, now I, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but part of this is that we, this was one interesting slide because we had a lot of um, discussions on it in Seychelles when we did the, the, the support re uh, reporting. Because the two important issues was that in a, in a typical household, how many decision makers are there? And then as, as the results show, 27% of the household heads, in this case, were deciding unilaterally. So then the question becomes, what then becomes the role of a woman, and how do you start empowering that? So I'll turn back this question to the participants later on. Let's see if they are able to answer. How do you, is it possible to create policy recommendation that starts uh, toggling now on internal uh, home affairs now. 
to really say, yes, we do want women to be empowered. But then the second question, how do you monitor such? You know, so it was an important discussion. But at the same time, one thing I wanted to also highlight is that we're starting to have data on such to enable these conversations to, to evolve. Um, and similarly, uh, one of the important things we always ask is where do they get financial advice? What kind of information do they require? And then also start helping um, the NGOs and developmental agencies to start identify areas of intervention uh, for them to assist in. And in most countries, most of the women, they tend to get their financial advice in their immediate environment. What that means is that it's with, it, they are getting advice from the husband, a, um, a sister or a brother or even a child. So linked to this is that you will always be as good as your household members. Then the question is well, how do you start helping them to go to reach outside the borders of their house, home environment? Um, and obviously one of the things I, I want to really stress that the, one of the advantages of physical data is that it starts giving you also perceptions, attitudes, questions, um, financial literacy kind of questions. Because linked uh, financial uptake is also linked to this uh, savviness of the of the individual, right? Uh, whether they trust the service provider, um, what are their attitudes? Do they feel confident to 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 pursue recourse? Uh, mechanism if they are dissatisfied. Those are some of the things we try and look at because it, it helps also for market conduct. Um, and then this is my second, yeah, my last line. This is just some, some to, to, to peg what our thinking is with regards to women. Um, so Petronella and I, uh, we still feel mark that we are women champions. So we mean, we, we are more focused on activities around women. So one of the things we want to, to unpack is the question that we had, I think, with your team, Yasmin, um, that it might be possible that women and men perceive and answer questions differently within a financial inclusion service. So if that is then the case, how, how, how bad or how good then are the results? given all the the surveys that have been undertaken uh, so far. I guess I'm also posing this question to the academic people to try and do some kind of uh, cognitive interviews to try and unpack whether the way we are asking questions is the same way people understand it. And linked to that, um, I think one thing that is currently not lacking but not highlighted enough is that there is data and you can do a lot of analysis with this data. So we, as, as the second project we want to do is really start doing a lot of project not, uh, uh, pro, uh, knowledge product on, on data analysis with, focused on women, for example, women in data financial services, um, women in financial literacy, all those things, using uh, different data sources. And thirdly, uh, I think also just to highlight the plight of a woman is to try and create a constant dialogue within uh, the financial inclusion community, especially focused on women issues. So as the third item, we are trying to convene a forum that will really highlight uh, women and financial inclusion, the results, the barriers, the uptake, what are the areas of concern, what data points are missing, all these things. Uh, that's my short story. <laughs> Thank you so much, Abel. Um, very packed. We have a number of audience questions here. Um, before uh, we do get to that, I just want to um, ask you to address a couple of things. Um, you've listed a lot of great questions and in insights from the FinScope surveys. Now, each country FinScope survey is slightly different because of the participatory nature in which these surveys are developed. So I was hoping you could speak just uh, briefly to that uh, process, how the surveys differ by countries, um, 
and how, for example, our listeners could get involved in that process. You mentioned the syndicate example uh, mm -hmm. in South Africa by the private sector. Um, and then if you could follow that up with which of the surveys are publicly available and um, uh, there was a comment that um, people looked at the YouTube video that was sent out in the reminder, but they were still a little bit unclear how to access um, the data. So if you could just briefly touch upon that before I go into this, these um, myriad of questions that re we've received from the audience. Okay, thank you. Um, I think, okay, I don't know. Uh, yeah, we need to find a way to for me to get to share my screens. It doesn't give me that option anymore. Anyway, talking about the participatory uh, process of FINMA, or uh, the FIN scope. Interestingly enough, in the uh, for the past couple of years, uh, or we had always been uh, discussing this with central banks, ministries of finance. Uh, financial service provider associations like bank association, insurance associations. Now, more of the conversation now we have evolved and now started to include the ministries of gender empowerment in Cameroon, for example, Togo, um, Rwanda, as part of the design process of the survey. So what that means is that uh, they, they are representative then start highlighting issues that they want to see the data collect on the women's space, for example, and link to that, they have dedicated reporting for women or gender 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 reporting, so that it starts highlighting those uh, those those nuances. So yes, within within the implementation process, we have something called a steering committee. Uh, but that is on the technical side, implementation. But the funder still remains, I guess, the donor and the syndicated approach, like in South Africa, for example. So that process, that rich process, then helps you start getting that country context right because it starts giving them the buy in and the power to own the data. Post the survey is done, they start analyzing it, uh, start giving this, this forum. Uh, dedicated reports and also even more recently uh, we started to have these workshops with uh, the private sector. So here's the data, this is this is the results, women are excluded and these are the issues, how do we best address? So financial education is always prominent within this discussion. So on the funding space, the, the South Africa example, um, there have been probably some few requests from different countries to try and replicate the South Africa uh, success in the sense that it's self-sustaining because the private sector would always need such data and they always want it as frequently as possible. Like you know, more of the, uh, the, the financial sector is more diverse now. MNOs are playing to the sector, uh, MFIs are now offering transactional products. Every, so it's, it's becoming more of a data-led industry. So, and more of the uh, users are, are using the data, SSP side. Uh, I'm not sure if I under, answered. Yes, all yes, the, oh, yes, the I very my, much. <laughs> I to my question. Yeah, I realize that you you perhaps are having a little bit of technical difficulty in uh, sharing your screen um, to show people where they can download. Oh, okay, um, right. I see you're yeah. getting there. Wonderful. Yeah. And as you show perhaps where people can download the data from, uh, it's come up now in the comments and it's also come up previously, kind of the internal capacity of organizations uh, to, uh, you know, uh, meaningfully analyze these data sets to divine the kinds of insights that you've just showed us uh, might be limited. And I understand that, you know, there are, um, you know, I2I and, and other institutions that can perhaps help provide support with that or reports that have already uh, provided synthesized results. So what's your message for the people who say, you know, we have limited capacity to do our own analytics internally with this, with these data sets? Wow. So that's <laughs> a great question to ask because of what I'm about to show. So, so our observation and experience is that, like you said, so 
unless you are a financial service provider, you are most likely not to have a technical analyst within your MIS. Um, so even even for for FSP or financial service providers themselves, they are most of them they don't really have that kind of technical ability because all of them more or not not all but most ninety percent of their time is always uh, devoted to analyzing transactional data. So in other words, data that is that they own themselves. Then the question becomes, how do you start really understanding those that are unsaved? Because the data you have is only showing the picture of people you currently are saving. What about those? So I think this is one of the good questions to start unraveling on how do you start creating that cross section to really empower the FSPs themselves and with the, with the, with the vast data we have and link it to the data they know. Uh, but anyway, link to that also. This is also one of the reasons we, we created this data portal. So um, there is two main users, three main types of users we wanted to, to target on the data portal side. So one, we wanted to target um, developmental agencies, people who are interested in the donor space, and then um, it started to really unpack for those that don't have analytical capabilities, uh, give them some kind of way to analyze the data. So this portal is just one example of those kind of initiatives. So as it stands right now, I'll, I'll also answer the question on how to download. So these are some of the countries that are there, and the list will always evolve because I'm currently busy analyzing uh, CGF data. Uh, so it will be there, it will be named in the correct space, depending on how representative it is, and all those things. So, um, so for India, for example, let me use uh, different countries. Let me use uh, Botswana. Okay. So Botswana, in this case, has national survey. It doesn't have financial data. So um, it discovered the national survey. This is then where the FinScope data is. We, we did not call it FinScope. Uh, so, when you down, want to download the data, there, there will be a button here, here, uh, here that says download all. It will give you three things. It will give you the full data set. It will give you the metadata to really understand the methodology, the sampling, the representativeness, and how to first go about the data, right? And then it will also give you the questionnaire, because for you to navigate the data, you need to understand uh, the questionnaire. So those all three things will be in the, uh, if there will be a button here that says uh, download all. Um, I need to get an example. Botswana, uh, we are in the process of creating that, uh, uh, making the data available. So in the next two weeks, most of this, all the data sets would be, you will be able to download. Um, similarly, on the UNCDF portal side, so you do have the UNCD portal, so you then um, there is a button for it <laughs> on the money side. So the FinScope, the FinScope data is on the tab for money because we link financial inclusion with money. Uh, start giving you uh, the results, and there, is a, there should be a button over here that says download. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Abel. And I do want to turn to some of the audience questions, and I'll just read them two yeah. at a time um, to, to save some time because I realize we are running up against the clock. We had one question about the difference, if you could briefly highlight the difference between FinScope and FinIndex uh, data. And uh, another second question that came in was regarding female decision making, but I think that you answered that in a later slide. But I'll follow that up with with the question on whether you track female-headed households in the surveys, because that's an issue of concern to many. Um, the short answer to the female-headed household, yes. So um, I think in the um, in the presentation pack, there is a, I've made reference to the Rwanda example. So it also starts giving you that kind of nuances. So all the data sets, they, we do ask a question on who is the head of the household. And obviously, because you have the gender variable, you are then able to see how many are male, how many are female, including children. So a short answer to that question, yes, the data has that variable. 
And just a brief difference between FinScope and FinDEX. Uh, two, it's it, it, it more of the sampling methodology more than anything. So one, the, the sample on the FinScope is bigger. Um, in other words, yeah, like much bigger. Say, say like you, other countries are going with 24,000. So, but FinDEX is just under 1,000 across. And then the, the other advantage stage now, because of that bigger sample, you are then able to do more data, in-depth data analysis because of the base sizes now. Mm -hmm. And we also had a question on how do you define women-owned businesses? Um, and, um, and to that, I also want to add, how do you f define active account usage? Because this, the issue of dormancy is quite real for, for women's financial inclusion, but for example, have a savings account, even if you're not frequently transacting with that account, that um, that might be the way in which you intend to use that account. So you could briefly discuss your definitions around active accounts and your definitions around women-owned businesses. Oof, that, that, okay, so the women-owned businesses, the, so in the SMME survey, for example, the first starting point or first uh, theater is, do you own a business? Yes, no, and then we start um, cross tabbing the, um, the, uh, the owners now with gender to really separate women and men. So, yeah, I guess that is the simplest answer. Um, um, and then on the active, like you correctly said, there are different definitions per country, per survey, per all these things, right? So, in film school, we always align it with country definition, but also to enable cross-country analysis, we have a question that says, have you transacted um, at least two, yeah, at least two transactions per month? So this is at least two transactions per month. Mm -hmm. And then we are also then able to unpack which transactions we're able to do. So some people would have checked the balance, some people withdraw, some people do this, do this. so the detail is there. And then we had uh, two additional questions. One was, do you have microdata on women's access to microcredit in particular? I realize that you have uh, questions on, on access to credit, but this user is interested in microcredit in particular, as well as repayment rates and actual versus intended use of the money. And, and I'll reiterate here that I, you know, we realize that the data varies by uh, country to some degree. Uh, so perhaps you have it for some countries, but not for others. Perhaps there's potential. Is this even the kind of thing that a FinScope survey would track, or is that more of a, a supply side um, data question? Sorry, which one is this? The whether you track uh, women's access to microcredit in particular and their repayment rates and the actual versus intended uh, use of of money that women have taken out credit for. Um, okay, so the microcredit, um, not really, but only linked because we have to define what the microcredit is. So because of that, there's always a reluctance to go that route when we are, do, we are sitting with the, the steering committee. Because similarly, the definition of micro is also currently vague and also differs country to country. Mm -hmm. So that one, it won't be an exact ES uh, for FinScope data. But similarly on the actual uh, versus intended or repayment. So one thing I wanted to highlight also, this is a demand side survey. So in as much as you can ask somebody, uh, have you paid your debt? That's as far as you can go to prove it. Because you can't get a, we don't want to get a, a repayment slip as proof that they have paid, paid. So to really get the actual valid answer. So it will always be based on the response of the individual. Mm -hmm. And perhaps you can go back to the slide that you had on trust levels. We had one person asking whether you have additional questions in your surveys to get at the reasons behind these trust levels that you've measured. Um, the reasons behind trust. So we won't ask specifically why you want trust, but we do. We 
we would have a series of questions, for example, that say, uh, would you take up or do, do you trust an MFI direct? So, in other words, we ask you if you take a, you trust an, a financial provider or an institution in this case, and then we also ask you, are you confident enough to then, for example, um, fight for recourse? You understand? So those kind of things, because those are some of the things that are linked with trust. Because, for example, if an insurance company, you don't trust it enough, you won't necessarily claim, though you can be insured. Mm -hmm. So we have those follow-up questions that can uh, map such a, such a proper answer for you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So then um, we, we also had some comments with recommended research questions for Finmark Trust that came in, which I'll allow you to to uh, read later um, as you move forward with that work program. And I'll just end with one last question to you that came in that's kind of an existential question, actually. <laughs> um, but you can use it as an opportunity to make some closing remarks before we then turn over to Dina Borjoji, who will speak on next steps um, with the financial inclusion community of practice and before our attendees complete the poll at the right hand uh, side of the um, of the uh, uh, sorry the webinar window so we had one person asking um, you know is the objective of all of this work a, a zero gap between men and women in in financial inclusion or is it really value added for women in financial inclusion. And I think we can see from your presentation today that it really is about the value added. You mentioned, you know, access to water, access to energy, um, you know, uh, decision making, all of the, you really, the fin, FinScope data presents a very holistic picture of the women uh, the women's lives. And so I think that as value propositions are gleaned from this data, the financial inclusion gap will will narrow. Um, but I'll turn it over to you for some, some closing remarks before we turn it uh, over to uh, Dina from the Community of Practice. I, I, I love your point on, 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 on the response. So I think even before we create value add, there has, there has to be something you have before we even enhance. So, in other words, financial services, that was, that's why I started with SDG, because financial services are an answer to something. So, for example, you accessing education, for example, and the barrier is you don't have funds. So, access to credit or, I don't know, yeah, credit as an example, gives you that ability to go and study. So, in other words, it don't, we shouldn't look at financial inclusion as a standalone um, item or indicator on its own because it's an answer to something. So in other words, in as much as we are answering something, we also want to enable everybody, so the answer to the zero gap, enable everybody the opportunity to use the financial savings to make ends meet on whatever the, 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 the circumstances are. One last closing remark. In as much as I've, I've, I've explained FinScope data, I still feel I'm doing injustice to the data because there's so much more. For example, we, I even even started talking about uh, GIS coordinates, how you can use that with mapping and all those things. So there's so much value in the FinScope data that is unexplored. But this is always an evolving conversation and process. So yeah, that's my my last 10 cents. <laughs> thank you, Abel. And with that, I turn it over to you, Dina. Thank you, Yasmin, and thank you, Abel, for your presentation. Um, I'm just going to then quickly talk about where this fits into the uh, working group's uh, work plan on data and measurement. As Yasmin mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, this is the third uh, webinar in our series on the publicly available sort of open access data sets for women's financial inclusion. We highlighted the FII data set and FINDEX and then finalizing uh, with today's. And what we are planning to do is to take you know, all of the research that we've been doing and discussions we've been having also online with community practice members uh, and put them into a knowledge brief 
uh, where we really uh, describe and compare these different uh, data sets to, to help people easily understand um, their differences and their different use cases and functionalities. So I think you know there's a lot of information out there. As Abel says, everything we're doing is so much being driven by data and big data and, and all the information that we can gather, yet there's a, a lot of information overload in trying to help people make a quick sense of the, the data landscape for women's financial um, data as sort of the first stop. But then from there, as it was pointed out from a question from, from one of the uh, participants and, and discussed is this whole issue around uh, internal capacity to actually, once you know the data is there and you have access and you're able to download it, then what do you do with it? And, and how do we sort of help build up um, the community of practice and the broader industry capacity on you know, analyzing this data, even if only at, at sort of it, not, not turning everyone into a data analyst, but we have all this rich information. How can we use that as development practitioners to help inform our policies, help design programs, and at least at a you know at a fundamental level make sense of this rich information that's available? So as part of that, we are working on uh, developing a boot camp um, and trying around. Um, kind of a deeper dive, on hands-on training on the FinScope data as well as the FII and the FINDEX data and really rooting it in some of those use cases around you know, tracking progress, designing programs, uh, testing out hypotheses on impact and, and helping people kind of manipulate that data in a working environment so that we can make, heads, make real sense of it, all of them together and compare and contrast it to help people understand how best to use them to meet their needs. Um, and then after that, we're, we're working, the next step is when you have that data, you look at that data, and you still understand there are gaps. You know, it, it, not all the data uh, tells you the why question. A lot of it's still even the rich FinScope data um, helps identify sort of what's happening, but not always what are the underlying um, barriers. For example, the issue around trust. You know, there are different reasons, different aspects that, um, influence people's trust to financial institutions or insurance providers and the like, but then, you know, what is, what is driving those, uh, those, the lack of trust in the system? And, and those are oftentimes rooted in other um, social norms or uh, legal regulatory issues, lack of consumer protection, other types of market imperfections that also need to be addressed. So kind of understanding that as well. Um, and so we have a, the last, uh, activity would be then looking at some of the evolving diagnostic tools that are coming out that are doing deeper dives on the social context and particularly around social norms and some of the trickier, some of the environmental factors that are influencing uh, women's uptake both of technology uh, and, and the financial services that that's meant to enable. So we have a, a link here on the last slide, we have a survey that uh, is on SurveyMonkey that we, any of you who are interested in continuing to engage on this data topic, uh, who have interest in a potential boot camp on the data, uh, data sets and, and upping your skills as a data analyst, um, if you would go to that link and fill in information about yourself, um, how you use this data, um, and, and what we're also trying to get at is some key questions that you would like to answer. What are your burning questions? That when you're going to these data sets and you're trying to download and figure out what are those questions, the types of questions that you're trying to answer so that we can also help shape the agenda uh, around market demand. Wonderful. And I, I see that we've actually, Dina, as you speak, we are getting sign-ups to the, the mailing list for the Women's Financial Inclusion Community of Practice. Um, so I hope that um, people will also heed the call in the chat box on the right to follow us on Twitter. We'll also heed the call in the chat box on the right to um, complete the survey. I've included a link there that's hyperlinked, so you can click on it. I realize you can't click on the one. Um, in the presentation itself, um, and as you you can see how how you know Dina's outlined all of our upcoming projects from the uh, data and measurement working group. So if you're interested in joining that working group, um, Dina, perhaps you'd like to um, give some instructions on that.
Uh, I think yes. people can make um, people can indicate that in the comments section as they sign up for the yes. mailing list. They can also um, contact Dina and myself directly. Exactly, we can get you on the mailing list, and if you have particular interest in that working group, then then I can be in touch directly with instructions on on how to get signed up. Great. Um, so with that, thank you everyone. Um, please don't forget to complete the poll uh, on the right-hand side. We do want feedback. We do want to make these web webinars uh, valuable for you um, going forward. We do want to follow up with you on any outstanding questions that you have or recommendations for future webinars or learning activities. Um, so um, we look forward to hearing from you, and thank you for your participation. Thank you. Also the slide yes, and also the slides will be circulated after the after the webinar when we send out our thank you emails. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you to everyone. I'll leave the webinar open a little bit longer just so that people can complete the polling and send in any additional uh questions via via chat um that um you know we'll follow up with individually later. Thanks. Hey, Bob.